everyone. This is the first Meet the Filmmakers session of our online Socially Relevant Film Festival 2020 this year. The Meet the Filmmakers sessions are put together to bring you the filmmakers. Please, everybody, when you're not talking, my, uh, can you mute your mics? I can also do it from here. But uh, yeah, I am muting. Right. So um, the session is supposed to bring to you the filmmakers whose films have been streaming from yesterday, 5 p.m. until tomorrow, 5 p.m. So you have a 48 hour period during which to watch these films. We have six documentary, uh, six short films, excuse me, which is a mixture of documentary shorts and narrative shorts and a documentary film. Uh, to which we are going to come later. So let me first say hello to everyone who's here with us and everybody who is watching. I don't know if I can see the comments. Let me see if anybody is putting comments. Yes, for the audience who is watching, please, uh, if you write a comment, if you put a question or something, I'm going to be able to see it and hopefully relay it to the filmmakers and to our moderator. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our wonderful moderator, Victoria Mikut is a, a senior producer at Al Jazeera Contrast. It's Al Jazeera's Emmy nominated immersive storytelling and media innovative studio. Victoria's journalism career began in her native Lithuania, where she worked as a foreign news producer and later as social media TV show host for the Lithuanian National Television. She was awarded with a Fulbright scholarship and earned a master's degree uh, from the Missouri um, School of Journalism. Victoria's work spans continents and examines many different human experiences from her own groundbreaking documentary, Invisible Her, about PTSD in America to reporting from South Sudan and the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. Victoria is passionate about visual storytelling that explores the depths of human emotion and shares the struggles and experiences of unreported people around the world. So the films we have today are, um, like no other, directed by Aziz Ahmed, and he is with us in the studio, and the producer of this film, Claudia Adams, she is also with us. This is a um, short documentary about the Pakistan floods in 2010, and it was one of the worst natural disasters in Pakistan's history, in fact, in the world's history, it should be mentioned. We also have Jeannie uh, Marie Halassi, who is the director of Mother, Daughter, Sister. It's also a documentary, a short documentary about the Rohingya women and the sexual violence inflicted upon them in conflict situations. We have, uh, I did not see David Rodriguez, so when he comes, I will introduce him. We have Mark Gregory of Chasing Glaciers. It's a climate change story, uh, a documentary, and it's shot in Peru, and which is 70 it has 70% of the world's tropical glaciers. And over the past 40 years, these have been losing uh, their ice and glaciers. Glaciers have been disappearing. And this is the film he is going to talk to you about. The last but not least, the last film is Voices on the Road. And we have Bethan John with us. She's one of the two um, co-directors on this. And it's a film about the Peruvian Amazon where a road is quietly destroying the protected rainforest, cutting through a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Many indigenous communities are struggling to live in this quote unquote paradise. These are the short films. And when we come to the documentary, after we have 
spoken to the short filmmakers. We are, I'm going to introduce those filmmakers and that short. So Victoria, I give you the, <laughs> the talk you, and maybe I'll put myself out of the studio. Thank you so much, Nora. I mean, it's a, it's such a pleasure to be a part of this festival and to be a part of this group. And thank you so much for all the filmmakers to, you know, watching your films. It's such so many important messages, so many important stories. And I'm just, um, you know, I'm passionate so much, so passionate myself about these stories. So seeing, you know, shared passion with you guys and how you managed to put these in beautiful visuals and beautiful messages. It's, it's very important to share that with the world. So a little bit about me, just um, in terms of what work I do now. So I'm a senior producer at AJ Contrast, which is Al Jazeera's immersive storytelling and media innovation studio. And uh, we use cutting edge technologies to tell stories about people from uh, global south, uh, about, about communities that are hit the hardest by inequality and injustice. And we do that also by including as many talent from the community as possible so that the story that we tell is told not only about the community, but also with the community so that they are the part of the storytelling process from the beginning till the end. And I know that most of you also did, you know, follow that process through your editorial and production processes. So I'm very excited to, you know, discuss these things. How did you come up with ideas? How did you make the documentaries and other films? So first, um, let's move to Like No Other, which is uh, such an informative film. Thank you so much. And it's such an informative film about uh, a disaster in 2010 in Pakistan. Um, it's, as Nora mentioned, it's the world's, the worst natural disaster in Pakistan's history. So my question, um, not sure if Claudia or Aziz would like to start, um, but my question would be, the film shows the reality of displacement and, and sort of the refugees, the people who actually, we are talking more and more about possibility of a lot of people losing homes because of climate change. And I don't think we talk enough about it. And, and you know, you captured those realities. So can you tell us more about that reality that you witnessed? Claudia, I think, I think your microphone is muted. Is it? I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes. I'm sorry. No yes. worries. Um, I'm going to let Aziz answer that because he was really there. Um, I would like to start, though, by just as a little introduction to Aziz to say that I met him through the United Nations, actually. Um, it, it was one of these incredible moments where I was chemically poisoned and was looking up the chemical and saw an article on the United Nations about the children of Pakistan. And so I sent a cold email to Pakistan to, I looked up in Aziz Ahmed, the name came up as a, um, a, a videographer. And I realized that he has the same compassion that I have, the same love, the understanding that you can tell a story, but to tell it one picture is worth a thousand words, go into the, where the children are. And in, in this case, where the, the migrants, the, the, the um, climate refugees and Aziz risked his life. The hardest thing for me was keeping Aziz from, <laughs> from like, don't get sick, don't get hurt, but do the best you can. And he always gave me more than 10,000%. So Aziz. Yeah. Aziz, tell, tell us more, tell, tell us how it was there and, you know, to do this documentary and to be there in the field and see and witness the reality that is out there. Yeah, actually monsoon every year in Pakistan, especially those who lives in a village, uh, villages is like, you know, a nightmare for them. Every year, almost in Pakistan, they have flooding, they have, you know, worst uh, weather. So I've been, you know, witnessing these things since I was a kid. Um, even last year, you know, almost 17 people died. My father, he belongs to basically from, originally from those villages. And, you know, they are very close to my heart. Um, and I used to go, I, I'm a journalist, and I used to go there for the breaking news. 
but if you go for the follow ups they have they are the you know like thousand of the stories uh, so i used to go for the breaking news but when i go to the follow ups it is there are hundred of stories and i talked to claudia and i said you know there are you know many stories especially the person uh, there was a man who was around 78 year old or 8 year he was you know just uh, going into the river and you know holding a branch and you know he was about to die but somebody filmed him and he was you know very like touchy and i thought we should go and make a documentary on and that time it wasn't climate change wasn't you know familiar with everybody but in pakistan since i born i'm looking those kind of weathers and disaster so that's why you know we decided to create a documentary on flooding and i did a documentary on drought as well and you know i did a documentary on earthquakes so that's why you know thanks to claudia you know she came up with the idea that we should make a documentary on this and i think it's it's so important to see you know that that kind of how climate change can affect generations and sort of have that also you know spur that conversation into how how are those people coping with it how are they going to cope further and you know how are they going to be affected long in long term right claudia absolutely and i knew when this happened it wasn't something that i could find anyone to commit to saying but aziz and i both knew that this had to do with climate change and global warming and we said well the real reason it started was Aziz became my friend long distance because of an email and he helped me and I cared about him and when I heard about the flood um I said Aziz are you okay and then that's how it really evolved uh it by people reaching out and caring for one another and these everything that we see the children the babies in this documentary as they grow they they will have the opportunity hopefully because of the this documentary what we tried to do is take the the voiceless and by the magic of film put them in the room with the the the, the changers of, of the the world the the people who could make decisions and so they could learn from another so that as generations grow they they will know have the help of knowing beforehand of when the floods are going to come um knowing where to build so that you're not near a, a river delta that or a, a dam that will break knowing how to communicate and reach those people um to get them out before it happens we've learned so much through this and hope to learn more and in each 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 step we're changing the way things will be handled in the next climb the next trauma whatever it is and it's going to happen it's just a matter of time yeah so just just shortly if aziz like what what as a filmmaker who witnessed those things and you know put together with claudia this film like what's the message from from your side to to the community to the world in terms of what you you know now and what you would like that people would change maybe or do something differently um as i said that it's been you know since since my child children childhood you know i'm watching and i'm witnessing those events almost every year mm -hmm. so now it's it's a time to change and it's it's time to you know come up with the ideas that how we can save this world and how we can stop this you know climate change things which which is almost everywhere in the world with and that is the most important topic should be you know nowadays um Uh, we all know that the coronavirus is you know going on but the, this this happened just you know now but the climate change um it's coming all over again and people are dying more than coronavirus have been done so it's it's i think more important than coronavirus they have to take it serious just like they have taken serious the coronavirus so um, it's time to change you know i think that's what i always believe Thank you so much both of you. So I want to jump to another film um Mother Daughter Sister and uh, it's uh, it's um directed right by Jean 
writing, director, okay. And it's a film about sexual violence against um, Rohingya women and Kachin women, right? Um, and it's and it's 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 such an important topic to talk about. And I've been myself in Bangladesh and in Cox's Bazaar, and and you know I I I also interviewed a woman who was sexually abused and. Um, these are very difficult stories to tell, and they're so important to share in the world, to, with the world. But to tell as a journalist and as a filmmaker, I I understand how difficult it might be. So I want to ask you, Jean. Um, you know, can you just tell us um, overall, like how you came across the story? Why is it important to you to tell the story personally, and how difficult was to cover it, and how you as a filmmaker went through that process. I think you're muted, Jean. Can you unmute yourself? Perfect. Yes, uh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And it's a pleasure to meet all the colleagues. And um, I've watched all of your films before today so that I could get a sense of what you're all doing. And um, just wanted to salute all of you and thank you for being part of this platform. Um, I've been, um, have spent half of my life living in Southeast Asia, um, covering um, conflict and human rights and social justice issues with, uh, based in Thailand, but with a particular focus on Burma. So I've been involved with the protracted issues affecting Burma since uh, the early 1990s. And um, the Rohingya are just one of the latest series of a very um, disgraceful record on the part of the Burmese military and all of those who support them in creating a systematic um, oppression of those who are pr predominantly from ethnic minority areas. Um, when the Rohingya exodus occurred, that led to what is now the largest refugee camp in the world where you have visited. There are over 1.1 million refugees in about four square miles, if you can imagine that. Um, one of the issues that arose from the early reports from international watchdogs such as Human Rights Watch were the testimonies of not just women, but girls. I mean, girls as young as nine years old, um, tragically, and many teenage girls reporting that they had survived sexual violence. And the Burmese military's response was immediately to refute that and to say not only were they lying, but they had been coerced by a fundamentalists or had been paid to promulgate these stories in order to discredit the military. And when my team and I um, heard that, we, we just put down a gauntlet and said, not on our watch, we're not going to let that go by not only for the Rohingya, but to create a connection with the long history through which the military has created sexual violence in particularly ethnic areas with full impunity. We created the parallels to illustrate that this is something that has been taking place for decades in other ethnic areas, in the Karen areas, in the Shan areas, in the Kachin areas. So we set out to make this parallel thread by way of giving the stories and the voices of the Rohingya teenage girls in the camps in alongside those of the Kachin women who have also suffered this to create a narrative that irrefutably proved that in fact, this was not something that was new. It has been going on um, without any accountability, without any transparency, and most importantly, without any justice for many decades. And that was what prompted us to make the film. When you look at something as difficult to describe in words as a genocide um, in any part of the world, um, as a filmmaker, one is overwhelmed in trying to discern what part of this incredible um, black hole of madness am I going to try to choose one part of this to explain and express, to allow others to explain and express the depth of suffering. And we chose this particular aspect of the diaspora, which was, um, you know, very serious. And for those of you that have followed it, you know that it actually ended up um, the Gambia brought Myanmar. Burma is also called uh, Myanmar to the International uh, Court of Justice, where it was determined that this was, in fact, premeditated um, 
and certainly crimes against humanity um, and the words genocide are, are, are used by the United Nations. So that's why we set out to do the story. It was very difficult because sexual violence is a particular type of human rights abuse that has a fragility and a vulnerability unlike all others. The reason for that is because of the natural um, predisposition for people to create a sense of self-shame if you have survived that is, is very striking. And it not only affects the survivors, but it resonates throughout the community. So any family member who has had a daughter or a sister or a wife who has survived sexual violence is also profoundly affected by this. So it's something that is done on purposefully with that intent to crush the moral spirit of a community by way of tainting them with this branding. Um, and it is something that has to be very clearly marked as violence. It happens to be of sexual nature, but first and foremost, it's violence in the most heinous form. I wanted also to ask if any of you filmmakers have questions to each other. It would be great to have the conversation if, if anybody wants to jump in. If not, I would thank you so much, Jean. I would um, love to chat more, um, but you know, I don't want to run out of time. So I would like to move to, um, do we have David Rodriguez, Nora is, uh, or should, maybe we can just talk now with about, um, Gla chasing glaciers mark and gregory is here and uh correct mark yes yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah <laughs> okay. and uh yeah so <laughs> chasing glaciers is a climate change story and it's it shows um uh, it shows through um and uh it's i really liked what you said in the film uh, you said a film for it's the film for those who see climate change as an abstract concept something that is far away and i've been thinking a lot myself when i was doing the climate change stories that you know many times climate change stories being sensationalized it's some you know when when something hits exactly like Pakistan floods, people start talking, maybe it's climate change, probably we don't know, but then it's happening every day, right? And and how to make sure that people understand that this is like, this is a crisis that is like a continuous crisis, that it's continuous process that is happening each second. And some people somewhere are actually struggling every moment of their lives because of that, or because of our choices that we do in other parts of the world, right? So I wanted to ask you, why did you choose such message and, and how did you sort of, you know, how did you make the film based on that message? What were your choices? Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I kind of explained the process in the film um, in the sense that I was looking uh, for my thesis topic and I was looking to tell a story um, particularly about climate change. And I was in Peru in 2017 um, with the landslides. And so the, the entire city got cut off from water uh, for five days. And that was like a very traumatic experience for me because I'm, I'm from New York originally, never experienced anything like that. And that was like kind of my first real moment of experiencing climate change in, in real life. And I felt like since I had that experience and it motivated me to, to change the way that I acted, I felt like I had to kind of demonstrate that for other people. And so doing some research, um, you know, I came across the ideas of glaciers and I thought that it fit really perfectly because, you know, there's three different things that kind of circle around that. And it's very easy to see kind of how water is affected because people depend on the glaciers uh, for their crops or just for drinking water, I think in most places of the world. Um, and as they disappear, um, you know, those are when the issues really start to come, come to fruition. And, that being said, you know, going out and actually giving a face to the people who are currently experiencing these issues with water and also seeing their cultural history and their landscapes uh, being changed for, you know, nothing that they never did. Uh, it's, it's really, um, you know, people around the world in the West. And so be able to, to kind of show that and, and demonstrate it and kind of provide a face and, and an image and, and kind of a, you know, a uh, message for anyone that, you know, you see a natural disaster, you see that the temperature is rising, but you don't really know how to to picture that or or to really understand it in a personal way. And so being able to interview people that not only were also there for the landslides, but then also 
are experiencing water shortages even at this moment right now. Um, I, I think it really showed the connection that we all have as humans. And I think it's something that, you know, we should all think about in our daily lives uh, in the way that we, we act and uh, manage our resources. Anybody has any question for Mark? I will ask the question then. Um, I, I'm sure you, you know you've been showing the film around and and speaking to people and you know speaking about this topic and speaking maybe about your experience as you were telling us about climate change and how it affected you and sort of gave you maybe a different perspective on that. Um, do you see how people are changing after they see your film or like d does it help to change the conversation in a better sort of way? D do you have you noticed that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it, there's two different reactions I get. Um, I'd say the first reaction is like from my friends from, you know, Europe or from the United States. And basically their first reaction is that I had no idea this was happening. Um, you know, this is incredible. Uh, you know, this this gives me a different perspective and, and I'm able to kind of understand now, you know, put a, put a, basically a face to, to climate change or to, to, to really understand it in a way that, okay, if, if I, you know, don't eat beef every single day, you know, or if I don't, if I, if I take shorter showers and things like that, like these are just small changes that in a way actually do have an impact and motivate people to, um, you know, go out to, to protest the climate for, the, for their government. And then the other reaction I get is actually, you know, I live in Peru now and, and people uh, who are from here who see it, um, I think, their reaction is almost as a reckoning in that maybe they, they knew about this place, but they didn't, but the information is just not publicly available. Um, and so there's not really a lot of information about the glaciers melting or, or the situation about water in Huancayo. Um, and, you know, I, and I think it, it I, at least in general, the cultures take pride in, in the heritage and, and, and the surroundings. And I think anyone, who I've shown it to here, you know, gets an enormous sense of pride for one, the beauty of it, but then also, you know, the the idea that there has to be some uh, actual fundamental action taken, and uh, I think that's that's the rea the two re different reactions I get. And it's so important to have these films made and these stories told because I feel also with my work and you know when I traveled with the Curse of Palm Oil, one of the virtual reality documentaries that I did about deforestation in Malaysia and about palm oil plantations, people were so interested in the palm oil industry after that, and they were so shocked that actually our choices, what we buy and things we choose, you know, could affect people so far away, indigenous people who actually call for us their home. And, you know, it, it, was, it was very encouraging to see so many people when I was in Sheffield Film Festival actually asking the questions, can we do something? Can, can, can I actually change it? And, it, you know, so I, I I can imagine you know your film is probably doing the same, and it's thank you for you know thank you for doing that, and thank you for telling the story as well. And uh, with this on this note, I want to move on to voices on the road. Um, Bethan is here. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, today is World Rainforest Day, and I think it's such a beautiful occasion to talk about your film as well because. You know, it's such a st visually striking, like beautiful film about the communities there, about you know the the communities in the Peruvian rainforest, and how the road being built sort of divides communities. You know, some people think it's good, some people. It's it's a very interesting story. It's a very interesting conflict in terms of sort of what what is the future, what should be done, and what is actually the right way to do it, right? So I think the question, and I, I know we talked about it on Friday a little bit during the panel, the other panel you were on, um, but I, I still want you to talk a little bit more about how you got access to these communities that are actually still very secluded and you know they're they're hidden in the fo hidden in the forest and this is their home and you know it's difficult to reach them. Maybe don't they maybe they don't even want to be reached. So in a sense, can you talk about the trust that you built and how you did that? Yeah, of course. Thanks very much um, for having me. Um, so I've been working in Manu Biosphere Reserve. It's, that's the area where the film is set in um, southeastern Peru, um, in the Peruvian Amazon. And I've been working there for about four years. Um, and each time 
I kind of went back to that area and I kept hearing about this road that was going to be built. Um, it kind of became an inevitable thing that it was definitely going to happen. And, and the regional government had already illegally started building the road um, sneakily over, over several years. And it caused a huge amount of conflict in this area. Obviously, a lot of conservationists um, were very, very anti the road and they've been campaigning against it. But interestingly, it was a, one indigenous community in particular had been campaigning for three years for this road to be built. And it just struck me as unusual, or at least not a story that you often hear that it would be an indigenous community that would want development. Um, and so we became really intrigued about understanding why that would be, because the road is predicted to cause 40,000 hectares of deforestation. Um, it will increase narco trafficking in that area of increased human rights abuses um, and all these kind of negative impacts that were going to happen because of the road. So we really wanted to understand why, what was going to be the benefit and how were these kind of communities going, seeing the road as, as a potential symbol of hope. Um, and it just struck us that nobody was actually going out and asking anybody how they felt about it. It caused this huge conflict between environmentalists and the government and communities, but nobody was really talking to each other anymore and they've become this kind of stalemate. Um, so we, one of the most important things is that we worked a lot with, um, with Peruvians that were already working there on the ground for a, a decade or more. So they had already been working with these communities for a really long time. And that's really how we established contact and how we established um, a connection and we spent a long time planning the expedition before we went went out there and making sure that we'd contacted all the indigenous communities, the leaders of them and made sure they were completely happy that we were going going out there and what we were there to do. Because um, that's something that kind of weighed on our shoulders a lot. Um, this was the first documentary that we'd ever done and we really wanted to do justice to this story. Um, it's a very complicated and nuanced story and and we really wanted to do do a good job at being able to get those different perspectives because it is such a hugely controversial issue um so that was kind of our process behind it and and what we wanted to achieve um and i think what basically what was very integral to that is just making sure that the when you're working in a, a in a country that isn't yours that you have a team that is absolutely integral that you have a team that is is from that country and they are completely deeply embedded within that and you use them as advisors and you listen to them and you you try as much as you can to understand the local context and you're aware that as a westerner you will never fully understand that yeah exactly and um, collaboration is so important and that's the main thing to tell the, you know to do the justice to the stories we are telling and you know, it's always as as I always say, like the these people that those communities, they're experts in their stories, and they should, you know, they should be the ones um, showing the direction how they want those stories to be told. So thank you so much, um, Bethan, for for your notes in the documentary. Nora, you're here. Do you have a, uh, some update for us? <laughs> I am here to police the time. Unfortunately, okay. I had to take Claudia and put her in the green room because this system only allows me to <laughs> on in the studio at a time. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, say to everyone how grateful I am that all these wonderful films have come our way. And I am honored. Our film festival is enriched and honored to be able to show such a program of timely, important, issue-related films and the Socially Relevant Film Festival exclusively dedicates itself to social issues. So these films fall right into it. But of course, we don't just go by issues. We also go by first and foremost quality, production values, and it has to have a message that is accessible to all. And I wish to thank the filmmakers. I'm going to uh, say something about a sponsor which is, who is offering us, let me see if I can do that by sharing my screen. Um, no, it's sharing the entire bazaar. That's not what I want to share. 
<laughs> so let's see if it will um, share this. But okay, I, I'm going to do it a different way. So we have Indie Picks Films, who is a partner in the film festival. There you go. Can you all see? Mm -hmm. And they have offered uh, DVDs. You can enter to win these DVDs uh, from the festival website. You have a button that says enter to win. And the, there's going to be one winner of a DVD per session. And of course, we have a thank you present to our moderators. So I'm going to let our short filmmakers go. Unfortunately, I'm going to bring Claudia back for a second so you can say bye to everyone. But if I bring her on, you can't hear me anymore. So <laughs> Claudia, go. So we have Claudia back. <laughs> so yeah, so thank you so much for everyone for being here and, and you know, you let's so much keep continue us. doing the work mm -hmm. and, and telling the stories that the world needs to hear about. Um, I think that's the most important. Yeah, thank you so much. Bring myself yeah, thank back. You. Thank you all again. Thank so you. come again, be part of thank the festival. You. It's your family. Once a filmmaker at Socially Relevant Film Festival, always a filmmaker at Socially Relevant Film Festival. In fact, we're preparing a um, retrospective on Black Lives Matter and health issues next. And we are going to the six years previously shown uh, to pick films that we have screened before about Black Lives Matter and uh, health issues to do a mini sort of retrospective. So um, please stay with us. And now I'm going to allow um, Juan back <laughs> with us. <laughs> so, and say goodbye to Aziz and say goodbye to Gregory. <laughs> and there you go, okay. So, we have Juan Borrero. Do we have Melody? Is she going to join us? No, Melody wasn't able to make it today, so I'll be by myself today. Okay, in that yeah. case, what I will do is I will take myself out again so you can have a proper chat with, um, oh, because we have uh, so, stuff uh, holding on from before. I better hide this. And I will go out and... Do we have Nora? Just a quick question. Do we have uh, people asking questions that... Um, yes. Is yes. there anything that, especially for Juan? If there are uh, any questions. Each of you okay. have an opportunity for impact campaigns. Can you any... Oh, somebody asked the question. Can any of you comment on any particular results of the efforts you have made so far? Of you considering, so okay. Let's, uh, okay. Yeah, if there are any questions for Juan, yeah. let's, let's definitely include the audience as well. Yeah, so let me go. So hello, um, Juan, correct? Uh, yes, uh, the current. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, lovely meeting you and thanks for being here. Um, thank you for bringing such an important film to, to the festival, A Call for Peace. And it's a very informative and very important documentary that studies the Colombian peace process, which was, uh, you know, one of the probably complicated in the world, but it's also quite um, considered successful. Um, and uh, I was, I really liked the, um, you know, the Colombian president's quote, what was mentioned in the film, it's saying, making peace is much more difficult than making a war, right? And yeah. it feels like that was the message that the documentary was trying to say, but sort of give options or solutions how it would be possible to make the peace. So I was, I wanted to ask you, can you tell us how did you come up with the idea of crafting the na narrative in this way, in terms of you know having in interviews, but different conflicts, sort of traveling around the world and connected different dots to this one image? All right. Thank you for the invitation to this festival. And well, the idea came from I'm um, born and raised in Colombia. So I never thought in my lifetime I will see peace in my country. That's something that never occurred to me. 
So when I saw this peace process going on, I was like, wow, seems like it's gonna happen. There is a lot of elements, important elements that looking like it is going to happen. So I start thinking of what story I would like to tell. So the first thing that I observed during the peace process was like, for the first time, a president had a group of advisors. All these advisors were part of different peace processes, former peace processes around the world since the Cold War. And it was like an inclusion, a big inclusion into the international community into this peace process. So that was this was the innovation and the different thing that I saw in the story. So I decided to follow all these people, what they were doing before the peace process in Colombia. So to uh, all of them were before, for example, Jonathan Powell was the one who from day one in the cabinet of Johnny Blair, of Tony Blair started the peace process with the, the Irish peace process, which ended up with the Good Friday Agreement. So he was one of the first advisors of uh, Manuel Santos. Then uh, we realized also that the, one of the international supporters of the process, which is the Ireland at the time, European Union, the head of the European Union and delegate of the European Union on the Colombian peace process was part of this peace process in the Irish peace process. Uh, Shlomo Benami was the main negotiator between the Palestinians and the Israelis in the Oslo Agreement. So he brought to the table all the Oslo Agreement, uh, the base of the Oslo Agreement to implement it in the Colombian peace process. Um, so yeah. while we're mentioning all these names also, can you tell us how did you get these names to talk to you, you know, on camera and sort of, it must have been a difficult process as well. Yeah. To these high yeah. qual you know, high profile politicians and yeah, advisors. Very like very high profile people that were still working in different peace process around the world. So they are all day working. Some of them were at the time were working in North Korea, in Venezuela and in uh, Philippines, different peace process around the world. So it was quite difficult to get them to have a, first of all, to trust in the process and second, to have an actual interview with them. So the first part was like we, uh, I work at the UN as a freelance documentary filmmaker. So I have different good contacts within the UN. So through the UN, I was able to talk to different ambassadors, different people involved around the peace process and create a, like an, um, an atmosphere of trust of people who can recommend me and recommend my crew at least to have these people listen to me. So the first interview took six months going back and forth in emails until we had the first one, who was for uh, wow. Bernard Aronson, the, the special advisor from the United States to the Colombian peace process. And after that, it was easier to tell them like, okay, Bernard Aronson agrees, he thinks it's a great project. And from there, each project was taking a little less time actually. That's it was quite difficult. For example, uh, we have Jonathan Powell, in London to do an interview and he has to delay his his interview one day or two days. We didn't know because he was coming from North Korea. He was still dealing with the North Korea uh, beginning of the peace process. So we were in London waiting for him and we were already set up another interview in Dublin. So all the interviews were like kind of coming together. Day. So it was so tell me, Juan, um, the person who did, you know, who researched probably the whole process so much and got into the room with these very powerful people and, and talked about this process with them and created a narrative and documentary about it. What are the lessons? What did you learn about peacemaking process? Can you share with the audience in terms of from your own perspective? What's something that maybe you didn't know or you didn't imagine that actually these are the answers? There's some basic answers that you know, you don't think about it. It's like a basic uh, thing that is the compassion. Put yourself in the other's uh, shoes. So that's the first thing you have to think when you are making a peace process. 
you are dealing with your enemy, or sometimes you don't you need you don't have to call him an enemy, your adversary. So you have to see that person or the opponent with compassion, where he comes from, what are his reasons, and in that way you can humanize a peace process, and that person will be drawn into an honest peace talk with you. So it's like, that's that was something that's very basic that struck me. And how difficult was to create, um, you know, the narrative in terms of, I'm sure you had hours and hours of interviews and, you know, so much, as you were saying, like the every advisor and every person came with so much experience in different conflicts. And and how was as a you know as an artist as a filmmaker to sort of put that together? How, can you tell us more about that process? Right. So I decided to tell the story, telling all the conflicts that you have on a peace process. You have different conflicts that happen in every peace process around the world. It's not like like a straight line. You have too many bumps in the road. So we started like, okay, why is first like why is good to have a peace, a peace process? That's how the documentary starts. So Eamon Gilmore says that after 50 years of war, uh, in after you know, after 50 years in Ireland, finally they don't have even a government. They have a lot of disagreements in the table, political disagreements, but they are not killing each other, right? And that applies to the rest of the world. And after that, so I was trying to apply different things that will sound like foreign for the peace process of Colombia, but at the end will be the same application for the peace process in Colombia. Everything will be relative to each process around the world and will be applic applicable to the peace process in Colombia. So first, all the problems, then how the problems were how the problems were solved, and then the lessons. That's how I structured the film. Going from outside, so because the first time that we mentioned Colombia in the film is like a minute 15. So I started asking the question is like why is this really about Colombia? And it's of course it's really about Colombia and it's because at the end, peace around the world means peace for everybody. And in this case, for Colombia. And how was the film uh, received at home in Colombia? Did it actually, um, you know, spark good conversations or how was it um, sort of what people had to say about it? Actually, it was, it had a good response in Colombia. I was surprised because there is a lot of, there's a big polarization. I don't know if you know that in between the people who is pro-peace and the people who doesn't agree with this peace process. So I had big expectations about the, what the people will think about it, the audience, but I had really good, um, really good comments at the end of every time we show the film, people came to us and tell us like, wow, I never thought about it, the peace process in that way. You're opening my mind. You're make, making me think in a different way about this peace process. And it was mostly thanking me to give them this different perspective. And do you think, um, in general, when you're traveling, let's say, around the festivals with the film and presenting the film in different parts of the world, like, and especially now as we have, you know, pandemic around the world and we have some conflicts that are really... You know, we have do we do have a lot of conflicts around the world that are a lot of times stuck, and you know it's difficult to. Is there something that you think um, we can learn from Colombian peace process, and and sort of the film can bring? I mean, you mentioned a little bit already, like empathy, but do you think in the current situation, like, is there something yes. that you know we can take from Colombia, a very specific thing, right. and could actually apply somewhere else? Something important is like see the conflict from outside because everybody is leaving the conflict inside, so they don't see a way out. Everybody thinks that their conflict, the conflict they are living, is the worst, and then on Earth, and that it cannot be solved. So that requires 
to thinking out of the box. So that's why it's important to have people who can look into this conflict from outside and can give you an external view of your conflict and see and can see solutions that you are not able to see. So this is one of the main lessons I think so that the use of external advisors, people that are not involved in the conflict that hasn't lived the conflict, but is able to relate and see how we can move ahead in peace. Yeah. Nora, do you have any questions? <laughs> Here you go, perfect timing. <laughs> I think you're muted, Nora. Yeah. Nora, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, sorry. <laughs> no worries. What is the status of constitutional reform after the scheduled referendum last April? This is a comment. You can't see the comment when I put it on the screen? I cannot see. So, oh, no, I see. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can see it now. I can see it. Yeah, what is the status of the okay. constitutional reform? After um, the scheduled referendum last April. Yeah, because then yeah. I can... So the referendum that happened to approve, I guess, is a referendum to approve the peace process. Okay. Like, that referendum. So that's was explained, that's explained in the film. That was a referendum. So was the people was the question was about if the people approve this peace process or not. So the people who didn't approve the peace process won the referendum. So the president has to talked with the opposition, uh, asked them to bring new points to the table. He gathered different new options and he discussed again those new points with the guerrilla in Havana. Those new points were mostly approved, like in an 80 or 90% of the points that the opposition brought were approved. And finally, the the peace process was approved by the Congress after that referendum. And after they went back to the negotiation table, negotiated those points and decided to sign a second agreement. It's a very long process. You know? yeah. Years, yeah. Peace talks can last years and years, decades mm -hmm. actually as we have seen in many different instances. But when there is a success story, we all want to cherish that and say, look, it's possible. It might take a long time, but it's possible. And that's I also shows. So I also have a question, Juan, in terms of, you know, you mentioned before you never sort of thought that you would see peace in your country and finally you saw it. But I, you know, it's still a divisive issue inside the country and especially former FARC members. You know, I know, you know, we hear stories about them struggling sort of to include themselves in the society or sort of go back to the life that sort of society would like them to be part of. And so do you think this peace process will hold? Like, do you see it actually, you know, can we can we hope that it's, it is a success story or do you see anything that could um, by any, you know, any force that we don't even know, like, could actually... I mean, the problem is, like, uh, the peace process is not done. You, mm -hmm. When you sign the agreement, it's just the beginning of the peace process, basically. So we are at the beginning of the peace process. What we learn in the interviews of this documentary is, like, every peace process takes a while to hold. Yeah. So... Uh, now we have like a very difficult uh, polarization in the country. Uh, there's part of the population that is not willing to continue with the peace, peace process, but that's it's up to the people basically. If the people keep fighting and keep asking for peace, that's what counts. So we have to see in five years how it keeps going, but there is like a a lot of groups that are still fighting and still uh, wanting to keep the peace agreement going. And that's, uh, there is hope. There is still hope besides, besides all, the, all the opposition that we have now. But I cannot um, say now that it's yeah. going to be a definitely success or not. But well, it's like violence level. is down by 90%. Uh, FARC, like, the dissidence of the FARC is very small, so 
is very far away in the jungle. Is like basically not significant to be a threat in the stability of the Colombian government. Well, we, sh we shall hope so. Yeah. Um, that the peace will, will stay and you know finally this this becomes true reality in Colombia. Nora, do do we have any more questions or should we um, do we need to wrap it up? I'm not seeing any more questions, but speaking of that, I'm going to say that this live chat, which we are doing right now, is going to end up on our YouTube channel. And if people watch later, they can, they're more than um, welcome to put questions in the comments and we will refer them to the filmmakers who can then go back and answer those comment questions. So the discussion can keep going on and it will not be closed after this live session is over. So we have another four minutes. So if you want to take one more question or give uh, one, one more question or something, let me check to see if there are any comments. I don't see anybody asking a question right away. Um, maybe I'll try to share my screen again. So, because I want to show the real thing. And um, part of one of the Victoria's answer questions is like, she asked me about how I developed that story, how that narrative. It was yeah. also part of having a co-director. Because mm. being a, you know, a Colombian, you have the story inside, but it's having yeah. a person uh, like Melody Carly, she's French, she's a foreigner. So she was able to see the story also so that's exactly what you were mentioning right to have yeah. someone from outside and sort of being together in conversation to understand it better right yeah, exactly exactly that was a big help to bring a different perspective a different point of view and a different narrative and did you fun. feel like her understanding was like did you guys uh, what is was there any contention in terms of you understood things or was it always an agreement like is there something in that process, was it anything? Like ninety percent of the time, an agreement. It's probably only one disagreement. That, but that was it. So that means that that's why you created a beautiful film, and that's oh, that's you. how you know that's how agreement is being made, right? To find exactly. that ninety percent of agreement. Yeah, yeah that's democracy. Yeah, <laughs> nothing is hundred percent. <laughs> process disagreements are always very healthy because they bring out the truth and truth is the best basis for any kind of uh, creative and documentary of course process and I want to take this opportunity and remind our viewers and everybody else that tomorrow our chats continue with another group of filmmakers and so on throughout the week until Sunday and on Sunday at 4 p.m., we have the closing award ceremony. Many of these filmmakers who are, you are seeing now are finalists, including uh, A Call for Peace. It's a finalist in the documentary right. uh, category. And we are very keen to see if it's going to end up being the grand prize jury winner on uh, the Sunday the 28th at 4 p.m. when we give out the awards. And let me share the screen. I figured it out. If I share the screen, but <laughs> what I have here, then what? that's what you'll see. But if I share the screen and go and do this, that's what you will see. So this is Indie Picks Films, and they are offering all these wonderful DVDs as a partner of the festival. They have been with us from a few years back. In fact, from the second year onwards, they've always been backing up the festival. And you can enter to win uh, a DVD from Indie Picks. And as a thank you, we are also sending DVDs to our uh, moderators. So let me go back and unshare my screen. <laughs> Um, did, did that come through? Because I don't I, think, we, no, no, I don't think it was. At least for me, I didn't see it. What about okay. this one? Share no. it again. No, we didn't How see it. It didn't work. Are you seeing it? No, I think your mobile option was pretty good before. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to go back to that. Let's see. Um, let me go back to my file. <laughs> Because sometimes this, uh, I'm not used to uh, sharing the screen of the, um, 
Yeah, you go. It's tiny, but you can. Okay. See it. Yeah, we can see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Much. Thank you, Vitan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think Thank you. you're already being taken off the air. So I'm going to end the broadcast and <laughs> see you all soon. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, Nora. Thank, Thank you, Nora. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Nora. Bye. 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 Bye.